So Dr. Raquel Bennett, um, she's a, a PsyD and a psychologist um, and ketamine specialist from Berkeley. Um, she has been working with ketamine, uh, as I like to say before it was cool, uh, which is to say since, since 2002, uh, which was also when I was in, I think the fourth grade. So it's a long time ago. Um, she has been interested in uh, ketamine's antidepressant uh, and anti-suicidal effects, as well as the psychedelic and, and mystical effects of ketamine and potentially the overlap and how those might be related. Um, she also founded the CREA Institute, um, -E the, the CREA Institute, um, K-R-I-Y-A, which I, Raquel, you have to enlighten me about what that stands for. I never actually figured that out. Um, and the CREA Conference, which I think for the last five or six years um, has been an international conference of, of uh, ketamine experts that have gathered to brainstorm new ideas and talk about the, the data and what's happening. Um, all of this, I think you can learn more about on her website, uh, the CREA Institute or CREAinstitute.com. Um, Raquel has uh, given this talk about the paradigms of ketamine treatment many, many times, probably 200 times. I think I have seen it six times and it's delightful. This time we thought that we would um, expand and, and try to make it a little bit more interactive and rich. So um, between, between us, we came up with a set of questions that um, address things that come up in ketamine treatment in mental health. Some from me, some from her, some from the community. Uh, and so it'll be somewhat like a, like a casual interview format. Um, and when we finish, um, then we'll have a free for all question and answer format. So uh, please do feel free to post questions in the chat. And when we're done, either I'll try to thread them through or at the end we can get to them and have a, a more open discussion. And so with that, um, I'll hand it over to you. And I should also say Raquel is my friend and I'm, super, and I'm so I'm really happy that she's here. And sorry, I'll say one last thing, which is aside from all of the work she does in, in, in ketamine and studying ketamine um, and, and uh, treating people, she also is a, a huge connector of the community. So especially in the Bay Area, she's someone who really weaves together the people in the ketamine world. She, she taught me what I know about ketamine uh, and, and brought me in, which I deeply, deeply appreciate. So it's, I'm not only grateful, but I'm, I'm, this is kind of fun for me to have a, a friend. Um, so thanks Raquel and I'll turn it over to you. Uh Right on. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Although I barely recognize you with your professional looking haircuts. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a little newer. Back when I knew when I first met Gianni, he had you know, hair like this. Uh, but you know, things change over time. Anyway, um, let's see here. So I want to, I, I want to talk about ketamine and how it's used in psychiatry and psychotherapy. I think I'll just dive right in. Uh, with the introductory remarks, and then we'll get to the questions. Let's see here. Uh, you, you probably know this. Uh, you probably know that ketamine was first synthesized in the mid 1960s. Uh, it was uh, it was it was invented on purpose, actually, as a derivative of PCP or angel dust uh, as a novel category of surgical anesthetic. Um, however, we no longer refer to it when we use it therapeutically or use it in psychiatry and psychotherapy. We don't refer to it as an anesthetic anymore because anesthesia is not the objective of the treatment. But rather, I think it's more accurate to categorize it as a glutamate modulator. Uh, and I think ketamine is the first of a whole new series, a whole new wave of other glutamate modul modulating medications that are in the pipeline. It's a, it's a glutamate modulator and it's a dissociative psychedelic. So in a particular dose range, uh, ketamine induces a, a, a disembodied uh, experience um, that can be quite profound and visionary, and we'll talk more about that later. And as you surely know, ketamine also has rapid acting and anti-obsessional properties that have been studied a great deal in recent years. That's one of the things that I study. And it's also worth noting up front that uh, generic ketamine or racemic ketamine is dirt cheap. It's like pennies as a medical supply. And it's really a puzzle to me why we're not using this more widely uh, in part because of the economic, um, because it's economically available as a generic. 
We'll talk more about that later. So in thinking about the use of ketamine in psychiatry and psychotherapy, uh, it's important to note that there's a number of, of important variables in ketamine treatment. In other words, things that the clinician can adjust or change. So let me, let me name what those things are uh, by way of getting started. So the things that the clinician can control uh, include the dose, how much ketamine is administered at one time, and uh, the route, the route of administration. How are you choosing to put the ketamine into the patient's body and why? There's a number of options for that. Another consideration is uh, the frequency. How often are you doing ketamine sessions and why? And we'll talk about that. Two other variables. Um, the fourth one is the setting. So it turns out that setting, that the, the, the emotional and physical setting uh, environment is, is of crucial importance when working with visionary medicines like ketamine and one that's often underappreciated and undervalued in medicine, but we, should, we need to talk about that. And finally, the fifth variable, the fifth thing that, that we can think about and talk about is um, the clinician's role, the, the clinical presence. In other words, what the cl clinician who's administering ketamine, what they think they're supposed to be doing at the time that the ketamine is administered. Are they engaging the patient verbally? Are they focused on medical monitoring? Uh, there's a couple of different ways that a clinician could show up and each of those uh, impacts the client's experience. So those are the five critical variables of ketamine treatment. So all that said, there's a number of different approaches to working with, with ketamine. Uh, and I summarized these in a short paper that I have uh, called the paradigms of ketamine treatment. Maybe we'll put that up. Um, and let, let me just summarize for you now what these, these different approaches, different ways of thinking about ketamine treatment conceptually. So one way of thinking about ketamine and what it does for people, what it does for depressed patients. One way of thinking about it is to focus on what it's doing uh, at a biochemical or biological level and to use ketamine as a psychopharmaceutical, in essence, as a standalone treatment that does something at a chemical level uh, that improves, rapidly improves depression and obsessional thinking in patients. Uh, and probably is, uh, part of that can be attributed to probably enhancing neuroplasticity or um, inducing synaptogenesis or uh, that the tips of the dendrites are sprouting. So that's one way of thinking about the, the, this kind of work, but I don't think that's the only way of thinking about it. The problem there is that when we, when we conceptualize ketamine as a pharmaceutical alone, we have accidentally forced the patient into a passive position, that the patient is just the passive recipient of this medication or treatment that's provided, and they're not often not being called upon to take an active role in their own well-being. And I think that's problematic. The other challenge here, when you think about ketamine as a pharmaceutical, just as a straight pharmaceutical, the problem is, is that the effect is temporary. It wears off after a week or two at best. And I think there are, I think there are other options for enhancing the, um, the interval of beneficial effect, uh, specifically, namely by combining ketamine with psychotherapy. So that's the next uh, paradigm that I wanna talk about you can think about ketamine as a lubricant for the psychotherapy process. And where the emphasis is actually on the therapy, on the, the verbal metabolism of psychological material um, in conversation between the patient and the therapist. Um, and you know, what we've observed about this is that learning is particularly potent and emotionally salient learning is particularly potent when ketamine is in the system and probably for a couple of days uh, following ketamine, uh, immediately during ketamine administration and then a couple of days following that. And so that's really a wonderful time. The ketamine does a couple of things uh, as a lubricant for therapy. Um, and but this is conceptually very similar, by the way, to how MAPS is studying MDMA for treating PTSD 
it's the same uh, basic uh, philosophy. Namely, that the, but in this case, the ketamine has some muscle relaxant properties and uh, helps patients to feel calmer in a low dose range. It can be agitating in a higher range, but calmer in the lower dose range and it allows them sometimes to get to material verbally that is too painful or buried or difficult to get to otherwise. So you can use the ketamine to enhance the psychotherapy process. And of course that could really only be done safely and appropriately by a, a psychotherapist using a technique driven approach. The challenge there is that psychotherapy is a somewhat slow process often uh, and it can be expensive. And so until we figure out a better way to subsidize mental health treatment for people who need it, uh, the financial obstacle is always gonna be a barrier to treatment. That's very concerning. In any case, there, there's another way, yet another way to use ketamine. Let me go back and say that the previous two things I said would be using ketamine in a sub-psychedelic dose range. So below the fully dissociative threshold, uh, that lo low or moderate dose therapeutic ketamine treatment. You, you don't want the patient too far out if you're wanting to engage with them in a thoughtful way. But sometimes it's appropriate to give the patient a full-blown uh, psychedelic journey, a fully dissociative psychedelic, dosing into the psychedelic range. And the, the idea behind that, this is you know fundamentally a shamanic approach. The idea is that the that the visions, the sacred visions are thought to be valuable and potentially beneficial to the client in addition to the purely biological effects and also what happens in the, in the dialogue or you know, around the psychedelic journey. Um, what do I wanna say about this? So when I started teaching this, this was a novel idea and people used to sort of like gasp in horror when I would say that the psychedelic um, dose range might be potentially beneficial. Now, as years have passed, we've come to, and thank you to people in this room actually, who, have, you know, who, who were pioneers in trailblazing this field. Um, but uh, now we've come to, now, now we're more comfortable with the idea that psychedelic journeys are not a bad thing, but rather could be desirable and helpful uh, for certain patients. So anyway, as we, as we assess these different approaches, a medical one, a psychological one, and a psychedelic one. It's really important to keep in mind or to really think clearly about the interval of beneficial effect. It turns out that these different paradigms lend themselves to different, the, 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 the benefit that we see extends different periods of time. So let's talk about that. If you give the patient a single dose, single dose of ketamine, uh, and you're giving them a low dose that doesn't have a particularly durable effect. Low dose being the research protocol, 0 0.5 mig kg IV on a 40 minute trip. The problem is, is that it works for some patients, but it's not particularly robust. And so to get around this problem, the industry has decided to cluster treatments together and do six ketamine low dose sessions together in a short period of time. Uh, and that in that way, they get enough ketamine into the patient's body to do the magic thing that ketamine does. But conceptually, they're trying to avoid psychedelic experience in any individual session. Because the psychedelic effects of ketamine are th in that way of thinking, the psychedelic effects are thought to be problematic. They're to be avoided or, or medicated away. Uh, they're they're labeled pejoratively as psychotomimetic in the literature. So they're, they're they're, there's a fundamental confusion between psychedelic experience and psychosis. And of course, we all know that those things are actually not the same, but that's a conversation for a different day. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that uh, if you give a single dose of ketamine in the lower dose range, you're gonna get a couple of days or maybe a week of beneficial effect relief from depressive symptoms. If you do a series, a, a cluster of low dose ketamine treatments, you're lucky if you get a couple months of symptom relief, two or three months. But 
when you do ketamine facilitated therapy and you do it skillfully, it appears that the, the beneficial effect can last for months and potentially for years. So this is fascinating and we don't have great longitudinal data to quantify this, but, um, but you know, working in clinical practice now for you know, many years, I, I can tell you that this is clearly what we see. And beyond that, uh, I have people reporting to me that they had psychedelic experience with ketamine sometimes decades ago, truly. And that, that they report that those experiences, that the ketamine induced psychedelic experience uh, was an information download that was some of the most informative and information rich or meaningful experience of their entire lives. Okay, so what do we do with that? How do we, how do we, how do we study this phenomenon? I think it's worthy of our attention. How do we quantify the benefit if we're only looking at, you know, with the, the research studies only look at what happens a week or a month out. We're not looking years or multiple years or decades out. So what do we do with this data? So I just want to put it out there and say that, that this is what we're observing clinically and anecdotally and qualitatively, and is really worthy of a further rigorous study. Last thing I want to say by way of introduction is that, uh, that the fundamental premise of CREA Institute and all of my work and all of my teaching is that different approaches are well suited to different patients. D different things work well for different people. And so none of these approaches are superior. None, none of these is better than another one. Or, and it, it's not like a one size fits all uh, is gonna work with ketamine treatment, but rather different patients are individually suited to different approaches. And the skillful ketamine provider knows that and is able to describe and offer a spectrum of ketamine services and match the treatment to the patient based on what an individual patient needs. For example, um, patients who have a lot of physical pain or patients who are medically complicated may be an ideal candidate for going to an infusion center for dosing that's beyond the scope of what a psychotherapist could reasonably do in their outpatient practice uh, or for medication combinations that are, that are specialization, for example. Other people are tied up in knots on the inside, and you can really sense that when you sit with them. And those folks might make an excellent candidate for a ketamine facilitated psychotherapy. So ketamine and therapy combined. And really only a tiny fraction of patients, of clinical patients are actually a good candidate for psychedelic dosing right out of the gate. That's, that's unusual. Uh, usually we start with ketamine facilitated psychotherapy and work our way up. Anyway, all of that to say that ketamine is, is interesting and unique in the sense that, um, that the effect is very dose dependent. So a lower dose could be a talking dose, a, a sort of substantial therapeutic dose uh, would be a dissociative and psychedelic dose. And then beyond that, there's a huge range of the use of ketamine and anesthesia, which is beyond the scope of what I'm gonna talk about today. But, you know, uh, you know, so low dose ketamine would start at like 30 milligrams roughly for a, you know, 150 pound adult and would go to like 90 or 100, maybe 110 milligrams IM uh, if you wanted to do psychedelic dosing. And that same patient might get anywhere between a 100, potentially 500 in a surgical scenario, a thousand milligrams of ketamine IV in a many hour, you know, surgical procedure. So all that to say that there's a really wide range uh, with respect to dose and the effect is dose dependent. So let me pause there and see what Gianni wants to say about this. Well, I, I uh, uh, yeah, I had a lot of little comments I was gonna add, but I forgot that I'm not the ketamine specialist here. Um, anyway, so a good place to start. So we have a, a list of questions and I think they get a little bit um, maybe more advanced or sophisticated as, as we go. But I think a good place to start is what is the legal status of ketamine? Can any prescriber um, or a certain set of prescribers legally give ketamine to any patient who wants it? Yeah, this is a really important question in a, an area where there's a lot of confusion. So let's straighten this out. 
Here, there's a, an important uh, and subtle distinction between what is legal, which is mostly decided at a federal level, versus what is legally defensible. I know that's subtle. What is legal and what is legally defensible? Legally defensible means will you lose your license if you're called in front of the state board, either the Board of Psychology or the Board of Medicine, uh, and that's, you know, that's uh, complaints against providers are adjudicated at the state level. And so that's where the confusion lies is that different organizations or different agencies have a different take on the use of ketamine in psychiatry and psychotherapy. So let me flesh that out for you. Uh, according to the DEA, that's a federal agency, ketamine is in DEA Schedule 3. So technically that means that a prescriber is allowed to use this medicine, is allowed to prescribe it uh, as per their best clinical judgments and it's like legally available. It's not illicit, but the state board doesn't exactly, that, that's not the whole story if you get called in front of the board. And I, I can tell you this because I've been, a, um, been called in as a consultant for a number of these board cases in different states. So according to the state board, uh, you're on solid legal ground if what you've done is clinically defensible and uh, the patient, uh, and the ketamine was clearly clinically indicated. That's the key phrase, clearly clinically indicated. And it's a matter of interpretation as to what exactly constitutes clearly clinically indicated or true clinical need. All of that to say that there's a, a grave misunderstanding that ketamine is a legal psychedelic. That is not the case. It is not a legal psychedelic. Uh, it's not legally defensible at this point in time. For a provider to shoot the patient up with psychedelic ketamine because the patient is requesting psychedelic experience. Specifically because that might not meet the criteria, according to the state board, of clearly clinically indicated. So you're much safer if you're treating one of the um, one of the indications that's in the literature, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and if the patient is refractory and has tried other conventional treatment approaches and they haven't worked well enough. Um, yeah, well, do I have anything else I want to say about this? Um, there, there's a couple of other hidden forces that that um, shape what is legally defensible. You also need to take into consideration as a prescriber, you need to make sure that your malpractice insurance will cover you. And this is an issue because the use of ketamine for mental health indications is, is not FDA approved at this time. At least the use of generic racemic ketamine is not FDA approved for a mental health indication. So the, you wanna make sure that your insurance carrier is on board with whatever you're doing. And then finally to say that the other thing is that uh, if you get called in front of the board, the way that clinicians defend themselves is by pointing to what is currently available in the academic and research literature. Uh, and this is the problem is that as a clinical community of ketamine providers, we have a pretty good sense that ketamine can be quite useful for psychological work and psychospiritual exploration for a lot of patients but this isn't substantially in the research literature yet. So that's one thing that everybody here could do is they could contribute to the research literature by writing up case studies. But in any case, uh, again, if, you, if, you, if you're a nervous Nelly as I am and you wanna make sure that you sleep well at night, you need to check the research literature and see uh, what indications are supported. Um, and uh, that way you'll know that you're on solid legal ground. So I hope uh, that clears up the confusion about this issue. And then Raquel, can you just specify exactly for racemic ketamine, what are the legal indications for yeah. ketamine in the United States? Yeah, happy to tell you. So there's the big five. There's uh, five clinical indications where <clears throat> the research literature is substantial. And so here's what those are. Uh, the patient has severe and refractory depressive disorder, recurrent over time. Okay, that's one. Two, the patient has physical pain with depression. 
Uh, that's a, that's another one. Ketamine is great for that because it helps uh, both both sets of problems at the same time. Uh, three, the patient has bipolar depression. Uh, more helpful for bipolar one than bipolar two, probably. But anyway, uh, the patient has refractory bipolar depression. Uh, next, the patient has OCD. Uh, or finally, the patient has a phenomenon uh, that's called a ruminative ruminative suicidality. And I just want to make a quick note about this. Um, that does not refer to people who become acutely suicidal in response to a clear stressor. It's not clear that ketamine is helpful or appropriate for that. But rather, when patients have ruminative self-harm thoughts that they experience as intrusive and distressing and recurrent, ones that have an obsessional flavor to it, uh, that appears to be helped a great deal by ketamine. We're not sure how. But I'll tell you the truth, I actually, I now have a new hypothesis that we're not actually treating the suicidal content, but rather the ruminative process. I think what we're seeing is the anti-obsessional properties of ketamine in the same way that it's helpful for OCD. I think it's helping that, that ruminative quality to the suicidal ideation or self-harm. Anyway, those are the big five that are in clearly established in the medical literature. Then there's a number of other uh, in indications that are currently being investigated and the literature is growing. So let me name what those things are. Um, so th again, the literature is not so robust, but it's coming. Uh, probably ketamine treatment is gonna be helpful uh, for certain kinds of disordered eating, anorexia in particular. And again, it's the rigid thinking or the obsessional quality that the ketamine appears to uh, alleviate. Um, ketamine is probably going to be really useful in treating geriatric depression, um, which is undertreated in this country, un underdiagnosed. I have a lot more to say about that later if there's time. Probably helpful in treating severe and refractory depression in children and adolescents. So it wouldn't be the first thing you would try. But if nothing else works, uh, there's evidence that this might be helpful. Um, probably helpful in preparing for death or processing uh, death in the clinical picture. So either your own um, terminal diagnosis or a recent loss, ketamine is probably pretty useful for that. Um, and then there's this really critical question. You know, there's, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that says that ketamine is useful for individual psycho-spiritual exploration in psychotherapy, but in the absence of a access one disorder. And so what do we do with that? Um, I have a lot more to say about that. I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna hold that thought. But anyway, that, that's kind of on the cutting edge of, of the ketamine field. In addition, there's a couple things uh, where ketamine might be useful in neurology. Uh, ketamine might be useful in treating uh, TBI, traumatic brain injuries, uh, with its anti-inflammatory properties, or, and, or in encouraging synaptogenesis or neurogenesis. Uh, there are a couple of research studies right now looking at the use of ketamine to treat dementia. Not clear if it works. I, I don't know that it reverses the illness, but it may slow it down, may halt its progression. So that's quite interesting. Uh, also some evidence that ketamine is useful uh, for the same reason in treating ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So again, these things are actively being investigated. Then there's a couple of places that are controversial, I think. I wanna name those two, where ketamine is being used, but where it's tricky. So let me, let me name the tricky ones. Ketamine might be useful in treating uh, people who have uh, substance use disorders or addiction to other substances, not to ketamine, but rather to other things. Uh, the ones that have been studied so far include alcohol, cocaine, and uh, opioid use disorders. But it really only appears to work, as far as I can tell, when it's combined with uh, intensive psychotherapy and potentially done in residential treatment. And it's unclear, it's unclear to me whether we're gonna have such robust results when the, in, in regular outpatient treatment. 
So we just have to keep an eye on that and see how things unfold. Another place where it's being used, but where it's tricky is with uh, people who have prominent anxiety. Here's the problem. Ketamine has both um, energizing and sedating properties. And uh, it appears that about half the people who have prominent anxiety, they feel soothed by ketamine treatment. They report that it's helpful. But about half the people with prominent anxiety, as far as I can tell, uh, are agitated by ketamine. It's too stimulating. Uh, uh, oh, am I echoing? Hang on. Uh, but anyway, so we, we want to be cautious about that. We don't want to overpromise, and we want to make sure that people have an anxiety management plan in place before starting ketamine treatment in case that comes up. Um, there's, there's, I'm impressed by the, uh, by what I'm uh, hearing and learning and observing about potentially the use of ketamine in chronic relational disorders, sometimes called personality disorders. Again, not as a standalone treatment, but rather in deepening the psychotherapy or in consolidating the therapeutic gains and insights. So you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't give someone a, like a ketamine infusion standalone for that indication, but you might drop in a ketamine session into an ongoing psychotherapy relationship for that indication. Not a quick fix, but may, uh, may be a helpful tool. And finally, the other place where I think we've overpromised and frankly overextended ourselves is uh, in treating trauma, PTSD. So for people, for patients who are uh, where the prominent, prominent trauma was when they were a little bit older uh, or was uh, accidental and not relational, uh, ketamine might be useful in treating trauma and depression together. And we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful in offering a dissociative chemical like ketamine to people who have a history of dissociative trauma. That's a bad idea. Uh, or people who have early relational trauma. People, people who felt like they were coming out of their own body during traumatic experience. Uh, and people who had a lot of trauma before their personality was fully formed. The problem is, is that the ketamine is too weird it's too disorienting for those kinds of patients largely. That, that's not to say that we never use it, but rather that we need to do so carefully and in a well-contained therapeutic frame. What I mean to say is there has to be a lot of trust and relationship between the patient and the therapist in order to do that kind of trauma work. Um, otherwise the patients are frightened and it does more harm than good, frankly. And I get a complaint every day of the week from a patient reporting that they went to a ketamine infusion center they, and there wasn't much relationship, not, not a lot of emphasis on the relationship. And then something bad happened and they hate ketamine and they feel worse and they're distressed. And I think that's because um, the providers have maybe overpromised what ketamine can do. One of the challenges here is that ketamine is, you know, one of the few visionary medicines that is currently available for use legally and clinically. And so we're kind of using it for everything, but it's actually, it actually doesn't work well for everything. And I want to add to that, that ketamine also doesn't work equally well. Ketamine does not work equally well for different etiologies of depression. But what I mean to say is there's all different things that underlie depressive disorders. And we need to start parsing that out better. Uh, ketamine does a great job for people who have um, who are, you know, who have that organic feeling to their depression with a lot of, um, it's, it's body heavy in the presentation, slowness of speech, slowness of movement, uh, early onset in life, uh, lots of, you know, hereditary uh, first degree relatives with a similar problem. And in particular, you know, the ideal candidate or one of the, I want to be careful in what I say. People who get a, long, a lot of bang for their buck out of ketamine treatment are people whose mood fluctuates in the absence of stressors. What I mean is, I know you've all seen this, people who uh, feel okay at night and they go to sleep and they wake up in the morning uh, and they feel god awful and their mood has, like, has dipped or collapsed 
but nothing external has happened to trigger that. Okay, those kinds of folks seem to do really well with ketamine treatment. But um, again, as I said, there are other etiologies of depression. There's so much overlap with trauma uh, or with, uh, you know, with physical illnesses, like for example, hypothyroidism. I can tell you right now that if hypothyroidism is the problem, no amount of ketamine is gonna fix that problem because the patient is misdiagnosed and what they need is clearly thyroid supplementation. I've seen it a hundred times. So this is really a question of differential diagnosis. Um, if the patient has substance abuse or you know, current substance abuse and it looks bipolar, but you kind of, you address the substance use, uh, you know, that would be a, con a concern for ketamine treatment. Uh, if the patient is grieving, um, you might consider ketamine facilitated psychotherapy, but not straight infusion, for example. Uh, if the patient is really angry you know, there, or there's inverted anger that manifests as depression, again, you might consider one form of ketamine treatment, but not another, et cetera, and so forth. I'd like to add, by the way, that if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of this, I'd love to recommend that you take a training uh, and we'll put up the link for uh, some recommended trainings. I'm not currently offering full trainings at, at this time. I'm not technically on sabbatical, but I have some colleagues who do a great job. So please check that out. All of that to say that, just to summarize, so there's some clearly, there's the big five, the established indications for ketamine in, in the literature. There's a number of investigational uses. Uh, there's some where we need to be really careful and thoughtful. And it's really important to think deeply about the constellation of depressive symptoms and their etiologies before coming up with a treatment plan. I don't feel comfortable asking people to throw down thousands of dollars in ketamine treatment unless I feel pretty confident that it's gonna work. Yeah, I covered a, a lot of ground there. Um, yeah. So there are the, the big five um, and that is, that is separate from FDA indications in uh, psychiatry, just to bring it to psychiatry. What has been approved in psychiatry is Spravato, S-ketamine, um, which I think that most people will be familiar with. Um, I know I yeah I know you have strong feelings about that, so maybe you can just um, as you should perhaps maybe you can explain is there a difference between S-ketamine and racemic regular old ketamine um, in terms of efficacy, and what are the other meaningful differences? Cost. The meaningful difference is the cost. We should be ashamed of ourselves, frankly, uh, that we're that uh, we allow the industry to function in this way. Um, so, as you, as you know, ketamine, generic racemic ketamine, uh, that's used for anesthesia and for pain, uh, is a racemic mix of left-handed and right-handed little molecules. Without going too far down that road, uh, ketamine is a chiral molecule, and. Uh, Nobody could make any money off of this because it's generic and off patent. Uh, and the pharmaceutical industry was unable to develop um, a ketamine derivative that worked as well as ketamine does uh, that was not super psychedelic. They eliminated a bunch of other candidates because they were too trippy. Uh, again, because the big pharma thinks that's undesirable. That's a whole different conversation. So what they did is they um, patented and marketed S-ketamine, which is the left-handed or left-bending uh, version, left-handed enantiomer of ketamine. So it's essentially filtered ketamine. Uh, and they jacked up the price. So ketamine is a medical supply right now. It costs probably a buck, buck 50 uh, for 100 milligrams of ketamine uh, of, for generic. And the equivalent dose of S-ketamine, courtesy of Big Pharma, uh, is uh, $850. Yeah, uh, we should all sort of recoil in horror. Uh, it's a, I think it's an 80,000% price increase. Okay, so you would think that it worked better, but it doesn't. But rather, uh, in head, there's only been a couple of head-to-head -head studies, but in head-to-head -head studies of clinical efficacy, um, the S-ketamine, the expensive one, uh, courtesy of Big Pharma, was determined to perform to be non-inferior. So not worse than uh, racemic ketamine. 
The difference is that uh, Johnson & Johnson, who manufactures esketamine, they paid for uh, the trials to get esketamine, to get FDA approval for it. Um, and so now esketamine can be used in the treatment of depression uh, for, for severe and refractory depression in combination with another antidepressant medication. Um, and so, you know, I, just, just to say, just straight up, the, the, what has happened here is that they have exploited a flaw, a systemic flaw in the FDA medication approval system. This is crazy uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but what else do I wanna say about this? The good news about the FDA approval for S-ketamine, the good news about it is that, that, that this happened in 2019. It, that, that demonstrated a couple of things. It demonstrated that ketamine and their constituent parts or their derivatives, that, they are, um, that they're safe to use in an outpatient setting, uh, that they are effective, which we already knew, but effective in treating refractory depressive disorders, uh, it clearly established the FDA approval, clearly established that the presence of an anesthesiologist is not required for working with ketamine in the lower dose range. Um, and it kind of moved ketamine, uh, all of ketamine treatment under the purview of psychiatry, which is I think where it belongs. We can say more about that later. Uh, it also established that using ketamine alone uh, is insufficient for treating severe and refractory depression. And I think, I think there's an important point in there. Uh, but there's a couple of drawbacks to this FDA approval thing. There are a couple things that are problematic. Problem number one is that the pharmaceutical company, Johnson & Johnson, controls the, um, the routes, the dose, and the frequency of the ketamine administration if you're gonna work with S-ketamine. And that basically takes away all of your um, all of your ability as a clinician to use your best clinical judgment and experience in treating patients. You can't give a psychedelic dose of esketamine. That's not possible or not allowed. Uh, what else? Um, the esketamine model, as it's put forth now, um, doesn't emphasize or value psychotherapy. It's it's you know putting forth esketamine as a, as a standalone pharmaceutical treatment, I think that's problematic and missing a, a, a clinical opportunity. And just to say again, that the dose, the S-ketamine dose, the way that it's administered is sub-psychedelic by design. Again, this, the, the industry sees the psychedelic component of ketamine to be a, an annoying and problematic side effect to be avoided. I have one other thing I want to say about this before we leave this topic, which is to say that, you know, Johnson & Johnson would have you believe that S-ketamine is, is greater, better, stronger, whatever. Um, it probably binds a little bit better to the, uh, to the pore on the receptor site, and it's probably more stimulating than the other enantiomer, which is called R-ketamine, or right-bending right ketamine. So yeah, they want you to think that more stimulating is better, but that's actually not the case. Um, some, for some people, S-ketamine is too stimulating and particularly for patients on the bipolar spectrum, it's too uh, agitating, too speedy. But rather the racemic mix, as it turns out, uh, the mixture of, of S-ketamine and R-ketamine, the S-ketamine is thought to be more activating and the R-ketamine is thought to be more sedating. And the industry wants you to believe that that sedating thing is, is bad, but it turns out that that's ideal for treating a lot of bipolar patients, that you want the activation and the sedation or the soothing properties at the same time. So I actually really wonder if the existing product, racemic ketamine, racemic generic cheap ketamine, is actually going to be a superior product for, um, for certain segments of the clinical population. Yeah, um, and so and now there are, I think there are a couple of trials, preliminary trials studying r ketamine specifically. That you just mentioned the other one, showing that it has I think in, in animal models it was the more uh, antidepressant uh, of the two enantiomers, mm -hmm. and then so there's the, these two recent human trials or one at least with r ketamine, showing that it had antidepressant properties, and you know I wish this was my joke it's not but it makes you wonder if you compared 
the antidepressant effects of R-ketamine with the antidepressant effects of S-ketamine into one drug, one blockbuster drug. Well, that's the other thing too, is that they're running out of orifices uh, to, to put it in, uh, you know, to, for novel routes of administration. So I, I hate to think what the advertising is gonna look like for products of the future. Uh, S-ketamine from the top, R-ketamine from the bottom. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's people meeting in big pharma meeting rooms right now discussing this possibility. Uh, but my philosophy is whatever works. So we'll see. So um, I know this is something that you you talk about, um, Raquel, and I think it touches on something you mentioned earlier, which is the the problems of um, over advertising of ketamine and and it being uh, sold or talked about as a panacea. I think probably cl clinicians do this less, uh, but sometimes it is does come across this way, um, and I think that is um, important to set against the possible adverse effects. So in your experience, I know you get a lot of um, uh, uh, messages from, from your clients, your patients, and then more broadly. So what are some significant adverse effects from mm -hmm. ketamine that we should be aware of? Yeah, well, the, the most, it's not really a, I was gonna say side effect. The most, the, the, obviously the most serious adverse event is when the patient takes their own life or when the patient dies. And that happens in the context of legal clinical ketamine treatment. Before I delve into that, let me just say that there's a number of treatable, uh, less serious you know, adverse events or, or side effects uh, related to ketamine treatment. I'm not gonna go into that right now. Let's focus on the serious ones. But anyway, there, there's been, I, I just wrote a paper about, um, that's uh, on MedPage today about 10 serious adverse events that occurred in the context of uh, ketamine treatment. So sometimes, sometimes patients are seriously harmed or as I said, or kill themselves, which is terrible. Um, in some cases, it appears to me based on the information that's available that that happened as a result of the patient's uh, serious and prolonged psychiatric condition and probably not because of the ketamine per se, but rather the, the ketamine provider and the team appear to do everything correctly. Um, but sometimes it still happens in this population. So we, we need to be um, mindful of that. But in other cases, it's clearly provider error. Uh, they didn't do adequate preparation. They didn't dose it appropriately. They didn't provide the patient with enough psychological support before, during, and after ketamine treatment. You know, ketamine is a strange experience and uh, it's unlike other antidepressant agents that you might be familiar with and requires someone being attentive to the safety, you know, medical and physical safety needs of the patient, but also the psychological needs of the patient. And when you're using ketamine, when you're offering ketamine for a mental health indication, but using it from an anesthesia protocol, there's some concern that the patient's psychological or subjective experience is overlooked or not, not attended to adequately. Uh, so I wrote another paper about this, uh, the ethical guidelines for ketamine providers. I hope you'll take a look at that. It's available on my website and also uh, in the Journal of Psychedelic Psychiatry. Um, anyway, all of this points to a really significant and serious education gap. The thing is, is that nobody I think gets a lot of or substantial uh, training in their at the in their graduate program um, on using medicines like ketamine and other psychedelic medicines. I hope that's changing, uh, in part thanks to you, Gianni, and to what you're doing. Um, but as it stands now, the only people who really get a lot of a lot of training with ketamine are people like anesthesiologists and ER docs, uh, stuff like that. Uh, people who are thinking about it for uh, sedation um, and, and pain. And that's really not adequate for working with mental health indications. Uh, so again, it's incumbent upon people, upon clinicians who wanna work with ketamine in their clinical practice. They need to seek out um, supplementary training on their own uh, to learn how to use this unique tool and to use it skillfully 
uh, to avoid adverse events um, and to be ready for the different things that are likely to come up. I, I can't hit that point hard enough. Training, training, training. Um, do you want to take a, a, a quick break? Yeah, uh, let's, let's take a, like a three minute break and then we'll resume. Yeah, and I'll, and this might be a good time to just pop in more. Yeah, go ahead, Raquel. Please take a take a breather. Um, and and for people in the audience, this would be a good time to pop in some questions. I saw, I saw a f there's a few more, and we'll we'll kind of um, uh, try to expedite the rest of it. Um, I think we're cramming a whole lot into each each question, but I but I I do hope this becomes um, even even more spontaneous. So if people have questions that are related, I saw. Peter's earlier, um, I think Raquel just touched on that, um, this issue of um, infusion clinics offering ketamine to patients with psychological issues um, without a lot of psychiatric support or psychological support. I won't speak for Raquel. This, I think um, there are like reasonable sides to both. There are um, strong opinions on both sides of this. And I, so I am not going to toss my hat in the ring. I think on the one hand, there is uh, an argument for access that if this works, more people should have access to it. On the other hand, I think to Raquel's point just now is um, safety should be primary, safety and training should be primary. And without that adequate uh, training and preparation from the psychological standpoint, is it safe? Is it ethical? Um, uh, Anna said, what are the, the big five OCD, ruminating suicidality, chronic pain with depression? I think the other was uh, severe chronic depression or, or severe recurrent depression. And um, I'm not sure. Severe recurrent depression, pain with depression, bipolar depression, OCD, and ruminative suicidality. Um, Carla is asking about the, the novel applications of ketamine, such as long haul COVID. Would it have to be used as part of a, a study? Um, so I, I probably am not the person to ask about that. Um, I think in practice, a lot of clinicians use ketamine for things beyond the, the big five. And I think there's, there's some, um, um, uh, what, what's the word? Um, stretching and bending of uh, diagnosis to, to fit the, the clinical need. So. If a person has long haul COVID, maybe they also have acute stress disorder or something. I'm not advocating for that. I think that that's what I'm familiar with. Um, some some clinicians do. Um, and Raquel is is back. So Raquel, I was just um, going over some of the, the questions um, in the chat, and I was also proposing that that this next segment, which Maybe we'll just go another, say, 15 minutes with the ones that, that we have, and then we can open it up so it's more spontaneous and, and free-flowing. Does that sound okay? Sure. Uh, one, one question I had, I think this, um, you know, so in, in the beginning, you talk about these, these paradigms of ketamine treatment. Um, you know, you've got the, the biomedical approach. It's the, you know, in some ways, the chemotherapy approach. Person sits in the chair, um, receives the medication. It's at a fixed dose. And the magic is happening under the hood. Um, um, and then on the other hand, uh, on the other end of the, end of the spectrum, it's the, the psychedelic model where the experience is, is crucial. The setting is crucial. Um, contextual factors are really important. Uh, preparation, uh, integration, et cetera. So, so my question is, um, what would be, what would be um, a way in lieu of you know, one of these expert training um, programs, what would be some simple ways to thoughtfully combine paradigms? So let's say you only have the setup for infusion. You know, you don't have lozenges, you don't have intramuscular. I suppose that wouldn't be hard to get. But let's say you work in a particular setting, whether that be private practice, not connected to an institution or a somewhat strict um, institution like Stanford with strict protocols. What would be some low-hanging fruit ways to um, weave in the, the the best of each paradigm? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me think about that for a second. Um, so the thing is that if, let me just start by let me start by saying that in reality, in clinical practice, we actually weave the different paradigms together in every session. 
because the ketamine is doing something at a biological level. Um, and we're attentive to the frame issues and the therapeutic relationship. And we, we may or may not decide to work with the patient in the psychedelic dose range all at the same time. So they're not mutually exclusive, but rather they flow and swirl together. So that's the first thing, just to be clear. I, I teach them as separate ideas uh, for teaching reasons, but, but actually they, they, they should be blended. That said, it's a mystery to me why institutions aren't embracing this more rapidly. It's uh, efficient, it's effective, it's economical. But really what it comes down to is this. Uh, everybody, I think, would benefit uh, if clinicians and institutions embraced the ethical guidelines. Again, it's a really short document. It's like two pages long and outlines the role of the medical provider or prescriber, the psychotherapist, uh, and the patient, the patient has responsibilities also. Um, and so why not give infusion if that's what's available? Sure, why not? But you need to get a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist in there or somebody else, a social worker or whoever is available on the clinical staff to again, be attentive to the patient's psychological needs. You need to do some preparation with them about the fact that it might feel strange. Uh, you need to sit with them while they're having the infusion Sometimes you sit quietly and sometimes the patients want to talk. Then they need some follow-up psychological care. So this doesn't seem that hard to me to implement. Um, by the way, I just wanted to add that a, a training, an introductory level training, this is not a training, this is just a, this is just a intro uh, overview. But a, 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 an actual training is only eight or 10 hours long. It can be done in a day or two. So it's you know, not a huge obstacle to get all the information. Anyway, what else did I want to say? Yeah, you know, um, Steve Hyde, who's an Australian psychiatrist, wrote a book in 2015 called Ketamine for Depression, one of the earlier works in the field. And he argued that it was unethical. It was unethical to withhold a treatment like ketamine uh, fr from a patient who had a refractory condition. Uh, and it's unethical to not try to use every tool that was available to alleviate their suffering when it's clearly supported by the academic and research literature. And I agree with him. And furthermore, uh, there's evidence that working with ketamine is actually cost saving for the institution. So that comes from Kaiser, uh, Northern California. They had a ketamine infusion program for a couple of years, uh, which then got, it kind of got petered out by a new crop of administrators uh, who were nervous about ketamine. But, um, it, tur it turns out, it appears, that patients who uh, come for ongoing psychiatric care, that they actually utilize less of the other services, including inpatient hospitalization, if you give them ketamine treatment and they actually get better. Uh, so I would think that institutions would be very interested in that information. Uh, it seems like a no-brainer to me to be incorporating this more into the psychiatric care. Uh, yeah, I, I can't help myself on that point. There was a, a paper written uh, by Eric Ross and, and a, and a co-author uh, like I think a year and a half ago it was the cost effectiveness of S-ketamine nasal spray in the US with people with uh, uh, depression, treatment resistant depression. Uh, and essentially with S-ketamine, they showed it was um, too expensive, which, right. is, which is saying something. But, I, but and I, this is from a, an interview, um, I quote, S-ketamine is too expensive, but it does work, the first author asserted. The question now is, how do we get the price down? And so I would have woven that into my earlier joke, but anyway, I, anyway. But I, I know how to get the price down. You get the price down by using generic racemic ketamine as much as you right. can, by using injectable ketamine as much as you can. It's uh, cheap, it's easy to do. Uh, you can give multiple injections if you want to modulate the dose. Um, you consider doing group work uh, as if it's if it's appropriate to certain patients. Some patients don't do well with groups, and some patients do fabulously with groups, and that dramatically lowers the cost. And finally, we need to be working together to get FDA approval for generic ketamine or racemic ketamine for a mental health indication. We already know that it works. The S ketamine thing demonstrated that. Uh, we've you know. It's been used in this way since the 1970s, for goodness sake. Uh, the problem is, is that there's an economic disincentive uh, 
for anybody to do the work that's required to get that approval. But FDA approval is essential because FDA approval, as you all know, is intimately tied to medical insurance coverage. And so until we get FDA approval, insurance companies are not obligated to cover this treatment. And that makes it an out-of-pocket expense. And that makes it too expensive and inaccessible. If we really want to address the equity problem, uh, we need to, you know, this is one pathway to do that. So anyway, I've got four suggestions right there for uh, lowering cost and increasing accessibility. Roger that. Um, okay, so, you know, when we talk about, so ketamine, I think, um, can be considered a psychedelic. You know, I think, Raquel, you would consider it a psychedelic without even qualification. Um, in psychedelic experiences, they can be interpersonal, they can be intrapersonal, and they can be transpersonal. I've heard it said that um, with ketamine, um, a person, a person I'm familiar with, um, uh, had a truly transpersonal experience, specifically and only with ketamine, as compared with other psychedelic experiences. So, uh, this is touching on on uh, Gabe's question in, in the audience, and, and one I was hoping to ask you too, is. Are there certain psychological processes or experiences that you have found are more likely to come up in the ketamine experience, say in the higher doses, as compared with LSD or psilocybin? And then maybe specifically, um, and you can touch on this as well, um, how it relates to the frequency of the classic uh, mystical experience. And, and maybe afterward, uh, Bill in the audience can, can uh, dialogue about this. I, I would love to hear what Dr. Richards has to say in a moment, but let me take a crack at this. Uh, and I'm sure that nobody here has ever taken LSD or psilocybin because that would clearly be not legal. So we're, you know, we're, we're, it's all hypothetical, of course. But um, so first of all, I would, I would start by saying that ketamine has some significant similarities to those other serotonergic agents, but it also has some very um, significant differences. And here's how I would characterize that. Um, serotonergic agents, including LSD and psilocybin and uh, MDMA, one thing that they do particularly well is they um, invite the patient or like, encourage the, the journeyer to focus in uh, as needed on a part of their biographical story. You can kind of like really, like, like putting a um, magnifying glass on something that's been causing you pain. You can really kind of get in there and work that knot. Um, ketamine is not so good for that. Ketamine, uh, ketamine when it's in the, in the lower dose range, in the sub-psychedelic range, you could potentially use it that way. But when you get into full-blown dissociative and psychedelic experience with ketamine, so over like 1.0 mig kig bioavailable, um, starts around like 90 milligrams IM, for example. The thing is, is that the patient or the journeyer forgets who they are. Uh, they, they travel away from themselves. I always say that serotonergic medicines take you toward your story, but ketamine takes you away from who you think you are. And the whole history doesn't really matter anymore, at least while you're experiencing ketamine. Uh, you have a shift in perspective that is broadening and tends to be expansive. Um, so that's that's really a key difference between a serotonergic agent and a, and a glutamatergic one. Uh, a couple of other notes. It is worth saying that if you do ketamine incorrectly, if you're not attentive to preparation uh, or to setting, uh, it can be an incredibly frightening experience. Uh, disorienting and falling apart and past your own death and all kinds of difficult psychological things can happen. Uh, I, largely a matter of preparation. But uh, if you work with this tool correctly and with respect and from a knowledgeable place, it can be incredibly beautiful. And people often report that they believe themselves to be in the presence of God or uh, that they're experiencing the sacredness of their own life or their own divinity. Uh, so this is something magical that ketamine does. Some of the other psychedelics can do it too. K ketamine kind of pulls for that, I think. And um, people who are very depressed or actively suicidal sometimes 
start talking about the miracle of their own aliveness. And this is such a beautiful and profound uh, and moving thing to witness in someone who a few hours ago was thinking of ending their own life. Uh, so clearly there's some clinical utility here. We just need to learn how to use this tool correctly. Yeah, thank you. I, I think one of the ways that stood out, I think it just maps onto what you were saying is, you know, if if um, if your psyche is, let's say, you know, well, how do I say this? If psilocybin may be a, a sort of a spaceship that could take you to the Mercury and, and Saturn of your, your psyche that ketamine um, might be able to take you to the nearby galaxy. So this is sort of like a different, it, it's not exactly to compare them in a linear way, um, but that they may be operating on in different, um, I don't know how to say scales maybe. Um, maybe I'll ask you one more um, and then we can open it up um, a bit. And, and that's the question I think um, that's talked about a whole lot um, um, across different kinds of psychedelic and, and MDMA therapy, which is, um, is it necessary for the therapist or a psychiatrist or whoever's providing the therapy to have experienced um, that psychological terrain of say having experienced ketamine or, or in the to say ketamine prior to administering the therapy? Um, yeah, without a doubt, I think that is highly desirable for, for clinicians to have their own personal experience with these medicines. Uh, largely because they're ineffable, they're indescribable and sort of beyond what the verbal mind can, can communicate. It's somatic and it's spiritual and it's, it's really quite hard to describe in a way. So having direct experience, I think, is really valuable and knowing the terrain. You know, they always say you would never go hiking with somebody as a guide who, you know, kind of like didn't, didn't know the terrain. That's, that's crazy. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just say honestly that I myself openly am a ketamine patient long term. Uh, I've been receiving ketamine treatment uh, for 19 years. That, that's how I came to be interested in this topic in the first place. And um, most of what I know about ketamine treatment and most of what I teach comes out of my own experience as the patient, actually. And so without a doubt, you know, um, being the patient um, increases understanding uh, and cultivates compassion. It's a very particular kind of vulnerability uh, when you're working with these immobilizing sacred and visionary medicines. Um, I also, you know, look to psychoanalysis, uh, you know, the most highly trained psychotherapists, I think, in the world, what, you know, this advanced training, uh, they all have to undergo their own personal analyses uh, as part of the training process. And I think I think we should be taking a cue from them. And what else do I wanna say? Yeah, you know, my father, who was a physician, he actually worked at Stanford. Uh, at, at the end of his life, he had a couple of surgeries. That, that was the first time that he was ever really ill. And he said to me, you know, Raquel, they should take every resident and put them in a hospital for a week as part of their medical training because then they would really understand what it's like uh, to be in that position. And that, that always stood out to me. So for all of those reasons, I, I definitely think people should engage in experiential training to the degree that it interests them and to the degree that it's legal. And uh, again, if you look at the training page on the CREA website, uh, you can find a list of organizations that are offering training. Some of them have experiential training. And so uh, be sure you ask that question uh, when you're um, signing up for a training program. Great, and then we will open it up, but, and I know, I know what the answer to this, this I, I said last question, but just this final one. Um, and I know the answer you're gonna give, I think, I think you're gonna say, check out your website because there's a list, but if you could recommend one book or one piece of literature about ketamine that people could um, read to learn more, and, and I'm gonna make you pick one. No, no, I can't, I can't pick one. I, I, can I have four? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Really quick, uh, I have a, a list of my favorite articles about therapeutic ketamine on my website. So we'll put that in the chat for you, number one. Number two, check out uh, the ketamine papers 
uh, compiled and edited by Phil Wolfson. Uh, that's, that's a really important work in this field. Uh, let's see, Charlie Grobe of UCLA just edited a new book called The Handbook of Medical Hallucinogens. Uh, I'm one of the authors on the ketamine chapter that actually talks about other sacred medicines also. Uh, the ketamine chapter in there is pretty good. Uh, and last but not least, I already mentioned this earlier, but if you want the shortest thing possible, um, I have this two pager called Paradigms of Ketamine Treatment that elaborates on what I said earlier about the three different approaches to working with ketamine therapeutically. And that's a really great starting place um, for learning more about this topic. Thank you. Um, okay, well, um, trying to keep this to, to a, a reasonable hour. Um, so we have maybe about 15 minutes um, or, or maybe 20. So just wanna open it up. Um, this doesn't have to be formal or, and it doesn't have to be through me. So if anybody wants, it, it can be, and, and I'll just keep kind of chatting to, to fill space here. But if anyone wants to ask any questions or Dr. Richards, if you wanna, or if you would comment on, on some of the, the questions earlier with, um, you know, comparison of ketamine experience and psilocybin or mystical experience. Well, I'd love to, uh, at least I'll share my ignorance here. Uh, Raquel, thank you so much. This has been excellent. Um, you know, I know a lot about psilocybin and LSD and ayahuasca and so on. I really don't know much about ketamine. And so uh, I really uh, value uh, the expansion of my knowledge here. I'm really struck with the uh, parallels in the history of work with psychedelics. How, you know, originally, in fact, even in my own experience in Germany, I was just given the drug and left alone, you know? And, and many people had panic reactions and got paranoid and, and we moved from the psychotomimetic to the, the psychotherapeutic mystical mimetic model and the, the uh, adverse reaction stopped happening in most cases, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I have a very strong appreciation of the power of the interpersonal grounding, if you will, uh, of really feeling safe and respected, uh, whether you talk to someone who's with you or not, but you're not just left alone. Uh, I think, uh, the way we dive into these other states and welcome them and embrace them as opposed to just kind of observe them and uh, get swept up by them. It, it's very important how we respond. And it sounds like there's a lot of parallels there. The, the mystical unitive state, states, um, you know, beyond language in, I'm always intrigued with the noetic insights there about self-worth and the beauty of life and the even what people think it may be the indestructibility of consciousness and so on. But, but somehow those insights have to be brought back into the everyday world. And, mm -hmm. and so in terms of the effectiveness of the therapy, there's experiencing, there's a kind of articulating it in language somehow, and then there's somehow bringing it back and relating it to everyday life is in the meditative disciplines. What you do after the uh, being at the mountaintop, you come back and you chop wood and carry water, you know, and, and how we help people uh, apply those insights and live out of them. Uh, but it sounds like very similar terrain we're talking about. And maybe it's not the drug, it's the human mind we're talking about. You know, and different ways of accessing it. And then it's a matter of titrating dosage and set and setting almost. Yeah. Those are just a few thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you so much for, uh, for your contribution. Thank you. Um, to, I, I would, uh, you, you triggered a thought in my mind, which is that the thing that makes working with ketamine therapeutic, the thing that makes it therapeutic, as we've, as you may have heard me say before, uh, 
is the actionable step, namely the, the message in the medicine journey that, that gives the person instructions about something that they can do on their own in their daily life uh, without medicine to move themselves toward wellness. Mm. And it's the, the identification and the implementation of that actionable step, uh, it could be anything, uh, that differentiates recreational ketamine use uh, and just for enjoyment from something that's therapeutic. Uh, and that's how, one of the ways that ketamine exerts a, an effect that goes beyond just the biochemical effect uh, is by identifying the behavioral steps that people can take uh, on their own behalf. It's so important. Mm -hmm. I was having a, a conversation about this. I, I'm curious what what your your thoughts are, Raquel and 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 Bill as well. There, there's a it's a, there's a way in which capturing the experience is important, maybe for consolidating it and integrating it, and then walking with it after the fact. Perhaps, maybe I guess that's a hypothesis. But it seems like it's possible that the same process of capturing it in verbal terms in a sense, risks ego capture or risks um, having the experience be fit into one of the, the same ego narratives that is sort of weighed down by depression or whatever it may be. So it ha what is the fine line to walk between letting an experience be, having it pay some nonverbal wordless dividend over time as a practice versus capturing it verbally, integrating it, you know, metabolizing it with, with words, it, maybe, maybe, there, maybe this is not an actual dilemma, but what, what's the fine line between those? Yeah, I think of the line from the Tao Te Ching, those who know do not speak, those who speak do not know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but how, how, yeah, yeah, how do we, um, it's easy to love all mankind, how do you love your, your boss and your spouse, you know, uh, how do we bring it down? Yeah, ketamine is inherently amnestic in the higher dose range. It makes it hard to remember or to process at a verbal level. And so in that sense, integration isn't necessarily verbal processing, but rather the, the sense of expansion, the sense of a change in perspective, the, the sense of divinity, letting that fill you up, even if it's indescribable. Um, it's a little bit different than the way that you think of integration with respect to MDMA, for example, or even LSD. Um, so, I, you know, I, <laughs> this, this, it's a hard question to answer. Um, the other thing is that ketamine reveals itself over time. Uh, and the, the more, if you, it, it takes, I have two things I want to say about this. Just looking at the time. So first of all, it's a huge mistake to give ketamine too close together if you want them to really do psychological work with it because it takes time for the message to unfold. You need time to be with it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes me a couple of days or a couple of weeks, sometimes even longer to like remember the thing that I needed to know from my, from my own ketamine treatment and from my own ketamine journey. Mm -hmm. So part of it is spaciousness. That's part of it. The other thing that I wanted to say also is the following. There, there's something called the Bennett Trio. Uh, the Bennett Trio is when the patient is truly a good candidate for psychedelic dosing. So that, take your training, please, if you wanna, um, uh, if you want that information. The thing is, is that uh, if people are gonna work with in the psychedelic range, we prefer that they sign up for three sessions, not, not a single session. Uh, because people are always invariably, unavoidably anxious and fearful in that fear first one, frankly. So what we do is in the first session, we're probably going to dose them. We're going to dose them a little bit. Let me say this is for psychedelic dosing uh, for the treatment of severe depression. In the first session in the trio, we're going to put them a little under. We're going to dose them a little under the dissociative edge uh, or the point at which full dissociation occurs. It depends on the patient, maybe, I don't know, 0.75, maybe a little less uh, big KIG bioavailable uh, for that first one. We, we do that because we want patients to be able to hear us if we want to give any instructions. And we want them to be able to mumble to us what's happening for them 
uh, if there's anything that they want to communicate. So that would be session number one is a, is a little under where we think they're going to, where, where, where we're going to lose them. Mm -hmm. I don't mean death. I mean, we're going to lose their attention or their, their desire to communicate with us. Okay. And if that goes well, then in session number two, we're going to put them in over the dissociative edge. Uh, probably at 1.0 mig kig. The sweet spot is often 1.25 mig kig bioavailable. In other words, 1.25 milligrams per kilogram of body weight uh, of injectable medicine. Okay, session number two. So at that point, they have lost interest in responding to external stimuli. They're in um, partial paralysis temporarily. Uh, and paradoxically, sound is dampened, but also amplified. I know that seems contradictory, but trust me when I tell you, um, et cetera. So session number two will be here. And then here's the critical part. In session number three, when they come back, we put them in at the same dose. You don't need to increase the dose unless there's some really compelling reason to do that. But otherwise, if we've, if we've done our job correctly, we repeat the same dose in session number three as what we administered in session number two. And here's the thing, people predictably have bigger, more expansive, more beautiful, more meaningful, more enjoyable experience on session number three than in session number two, even without a dose, without a dose change. Okay, why is that? It has to do with psychological safety, I think. People are familiar with, with us, with the team and how we work and the setting. And what happens is that they, the patient feels able, the journey or the client feels able to open their mind, open their psyche, open their body and receive the medicine and just go with it. And it goes farther. So that's the Bennett Trio. I say all that to say that, um, you know, it takes some skills to navigate the space. Uh, and, and so relaxation and safety is really important. And we've not found, you know, as, as I said, I've been doing this almost two decades and we've not found a way to shortcut that process. So, it, it, you know, you, you, it's just not, it's not like a one wham kind of a thing. It's, mm. it's, it's a process that unfolds in a relational context. There was one other thing I wanted to say about this. Um, the ineffability, Bennett Trio. I lost it, maybe it'll come back. But I, I hope that gives you some idea of how we work. Sorry, Ra Raquel, do you mind if I ask a quick follow-up question on that? So when, when folks have these very expansive experiences or, or full-on mystical experiences, does this seem to predict enduring change in, in well-being. Like I'm, I'm thinking of the Johns Hopkins studies where they saw that, you know, if, if, some, if a participant had a mystical experience that it, this turned out to be the strongest predictor in enduring positive change. I was wondering if, if you've all seen something similar with, with Kevin. Oh, that's, that's a great question. And by the way, Gianni, remind me, I just remembered what I was gonna say uh, a moment ago. Um, so um, Gabrielle, it's bimodal. Uh, some patients really, Okay, we're working with a very specific population. So people that we've seen typically have severe and refractory depressive disorders and they've essentially tried and failed other forms of treatment. So again, it's a very specific part of the clinical population. Okay, and for some of them, a low dose of ketamine is amazing, just like a little bit. And so they, they do really well uh, in a sub psychedelic range. Okay. Uh, and, and if you give them too much, they get frightened or distressed and, and a higher dose isn't better. For other folks, particularly folks who are taking particular kinds of medications, and for other folks, uh, they don't really have a lot of benefit until you get up into the psychedelic range. I, I'm one of those people. I don't really feel anything under like 100 milligrams IM. Okay. Uh, and so for those folks, uh, a really substantial dose of ketamine is needed. So if, if I was gonna describe it as a graph, I would say it's bimodal, so both. What's challenging is that you don't necessarily know what, what the patient is gonna need or benefit from before you start. You gotta try some things. And that's one of the challenges here is that because it's so expensive, we, it, it's hard to feel like you have enough space as a clinician to start low and kind of work your way up because people's resources are limited. 
And so it's, it's really a matter of intuition and it's a really a clinical dilemma. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, more, more or less. I think it's particularly on that, just that point of, because it seems like even with a high dose psilocybin experience, not everyone has this, you know, um, I guess they take a questionnaire after and then they can characterize if someone has had this mystical experience. And they, that once they've passed some, some threshold, that seems to be a strong predictor. So I, I was curious if, if that, if, if you've seen something similar there or if it's just, you, you know, you just know the results of the small amounts and the large amounts, and that seems to work differently for different people. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to say about this. Thank you for the question. Um, I would refer you to Dr. Matai's papers, M-A-T-H-A-I. He wrote uh, two papers about um, whether a psychedelic vision is needed for antidepressant effect and how benefit is correlated with that. So take a look at what he said. Um, I was gonna say something else about this. Oh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The thing is, is that a lot of, um, a lot of, let me gather my thoughts for a moment. A lot of intoxicating agents or a lot of things that, that, uh, um, that induce a non-ordinary state of consciousness uh, have, have the potential to magnify the mood that you're already in. And serotonergic agents in particular tend to do that. And we've also seen this with other chemicals. Uh, alcohol, as you know, if, you, uh, it, it, if you're in a good mood and you have that lubricant, it could be a really fun night, but if you're agitated, you could easily become rageful. I'm sure we've all seen that. Cannabis, similarly, if you're in a good place when you start, it could be a very pleasant experience. Uh, but if you're a little anxious to start with, there's the possibility that you could get really paranoid. That could be unpleasant. And so these, um, these agents are hard to use therapeutically in a suicidal population because the last thing on earth that we want to do is run the risk of amplifying the mood that the patient is already in. That's not going to work. Anyway, what's unique about ketamine as a glutamatergic agent is that it tends toward pleasant or neutral when it's done correctly. And that must be a function of its activity on the GABA glutamate access. I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but that's, that, that's the gist of it. And again, it has to be done correctly and with adequate preparation and relational context. But this is why we can use ketamine when other agents would be too psychologically dangerous. So, Anyway, I think that's relevant to the question that you're asking. Thank you, Raquel. Yeah, right on. By the way, I wanted to say one other thing from before. I, I said I forgot something and I remembered it. I just wanted to say this, that from my perspective, it's a shame that so many people start their uh, psychedelic exploration with ketamine. Because on the scale of weirdness, ketamine is way out there. You know, if, if it were legal, I wish that people had the opportunity to do the full psychedelic arc, uh, which is how I was trained, starting with uh, MDMA, which is probably the least weird, the, the least weird is the only word I can think of, least bizarre, uh, more in touch with like reality, and then progressing into something like psilocybin, and then progressing into something more arduous like LSD, and then progressing ultimately into something dissociative like ketamine, which is, you know, which is can be very, strange and or distressing. And so it's really kind of too bad that the legal situation is as it is. Um, and I'm looking forward to the time when that changes. I'll, I'll just tack on to that. I just gave, a, a, uh, I think you, you saw it, but I, there's a, a recent article by uh, Rebecca Rothberg and then Dakwar's team, the last Dakwar is at, at Columbia when they, and they looked at the trial with ketamine for alcohol use disorder and my, my understanding of it, we can ask Rebecca, is they measured, so, so in the history of ketamine, people tend to measure dissociation because again, it's been trapped in the mainstream psychiatric paradigm of uh, psychotomimetic or dissociative side effects. So there may be some um, uh, set of effects that are called dissociation and captured with a dissociation scale that may miss certain effects that otherwise measured could look mystical. So in the Johns Hopkins studies, they have like the mystical experience questionnaire in this particular study, Rothberg's study, 
when they met they measured the dissociation scale and then they measured the hood mysticism scale similar but not the same as the hopkins scale and what they found was that the dissociation uh did not predict outcome but the mysticism did so it's it gets to the issue of what are you measure how what questions are you asking how are you trying to capture the experience and what are you calling it dissociative versus mystical it all of this matters and it, it complicates the picture of what we're measuring and, and what its effects are. Um, anyway, um, it's uh, it's eight oh four, and I know that that means it's it's uh, eleven oh four on the East Coast. Um, so I, I do want to be mindful of time. Um, thank you so much, everyone who's who's come. Uh, thank you so much, Raquel, for for um, being here with us and, and sharing all of that. Um, you know. I will hang around for a few more minutes. Feel free, everyone, to, to take off. I think Raquel will also hang for a few more minutes. Um, and then, you know, if people have burning questions, then feel free to hang on. And otherwise, yeah, really nice to see everyone. Nice to see you, Bill. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I guess it's an unceremonious goodbye since I'm still here. But uh, but. Uh, for those who are leaving, take care.